Okay, what are we starting with, and let's get doing it. Uh, sorry, let's start over. Have we started again? That was never five minutes just then. I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to argue unless you've paid. Warning, you're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Welcome to the Broken Mirror Story Event. Wheel in the sky keeps on turning. I don't know where I'll be tomorrow. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 89. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome to the show, folks. So, hey, today we're going to bring you another of our Broken Mirror Story Event <laughs> winners, champions, rulers, leaders. Say more words. Keep going. The, 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 Come on, you the can do triumphant it. few, the proud. Really. <laughs> the, the Marines? Well, I, I wouldn't go that far. The, the <laughs> Space Marines. Oh, yes, we like Space Marines. That's right. All right. Finalists. Ooh, finalists. That's a good word. That story is? The story is Dax Plays Fair with an E on the end because it's like an old timey kind of fair. Oh, no. Yes, he did. He did. Okay. Wait, is it too late to retract my vote? <laughs> you have something against that, huh? It's Dax Plays Ye Old Fair, and the old has an E on the end of it, too. <laughs> and that is the reason that this is our last episode. Folks. <laughs> You're listening to the final episode of the Dune Steve audio fiction magazine. <laughs> this is totally going off the subject, but I've got to mention it. You know, we got a submission the other day from a fellow in Britain where he spelt tire with a y. With a y. Yeah. I'd never saw oh, I, I was blown right off of my seat when What's I saw that. What's funny is I don't think all of them do that. I see tire with a y sometimes, uh -huh. but other times I believe I see it spelled correctly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said it. I was going to go there, too. <laughs> um, well, who wrote Dax Plays Fairy? Yeah, sorry. Back to the beat, y'all. Um, <laughs> Dax Plays Fair is written by Void Munashi. Hey, hey, Munashi? Stop screwing around. Who wrote Dax Plays Fair? <laughs> Void Munashi. Okay, uh, it's wrote, not funny anymore, man. Wrote this story, and uh, yeah, it, it was a fun story. I, I really let's enjoyed let it. Let's let them decide that. Let's read this story. Well, no, I, I'm not going to let them decide. They're in for a treat. Sit back, folks, relax, and enjoy the show. About the author. Void Munashi lives in the Sacramento area with his wife Osaka and her cat. When he's not writing, he enjoys playing video games and reading and watching anime. He's been writing off and on since he was in grade school, and his biggest writing achievement, aside from this, obviously, has been completing his blog novel, Malville, a journal of the zombie apocalypse, which you can find a link to in the show notes. We'd also like to thank Juliet Bowler, Rich Girardi, and Lizanne Hurd for lending their voices to today's episode. And you can check out links to all of them in the show notes. Dax Plays Fair by Void Munashi When Reg said this town was in the middle of nowhere, he wasn't kidding. You know, I get this whole planned community thing, but why in the middle of the Nevada desert, and why in the world would you build it so far away from everything else? There's not even a portal directly into it. I have my windows rolled up and the air conditioner blasting against the 110 degree heat as I speed past the sign reading, Arcadium Acres, 15 miles, gas, food, lodging. Sure, 110 is not so bad when compared to the 120 I dealt with on a daily basis while I was doing jobs in the Middle East, but that doesn't mean I have to like it. The temperature is not my biggest concern, though. My assignment is... This one is different, Dax. Reginald Thracken, my handler in purgatory, explained to me as I sat in his small office yesterday. We've already lost contact with one hunter. Was he killed? I asked. Kill is not really the right word. 
as the guns merely banish their victims to hell rather than actually kill them, seeing as I found myself at the wrong end of my own gun the first time around. I am rather leery of losing my weapons now. She, and not that I'm being told. I don't know what happened to her, but as far as I know, she is still active, just missing. How can you not know? You guys know if I even think of punching someone, how can you just lose a hunter like that? I know what I'm told, Zader. You know that. The higher-ups aren't telling me anything, and I don't know if that means they don't know or not. Reg explained. Her last report was two days ago. Said that her ring was giving her false positives all over town. That gave me a pause for thought. A hunter is issued very few tools. A gun, a knife for a backup, and our agency ring. While the gun and knife are useful in that they can actually banish a demon, or an agent for that matter, the ring is probably the most useful in that it helps us to identify any demonic presence no matter how well they disguise themselves. Usually. None of the other agents in town saw her? I asked. Not every agent of purgatory is a hunter like me. Many are put into jobs in the DMV, post office, police, or other positions where they can provide support for active agents like myself. There are no other agents in the town where we track this demon. It's a relatively new town, and no agents have been installed yet. Efficient. Reg looked at me with one eyebrow raised. I would think you would be used to that by now. You've been doing this, what, five years now? Yeah, all right. So what do we have on this demon? A another succubus? It's a mutator for Marum. Don't speak Latin at me, Reg. Shapeshifter. It can be whoever it wants. So not only do we not have any pictures of it... But with my ring not working right, I won't even be able to tell if I'm close or not. I finished his sentence. This is hardly my first assignment, and it's not as if I'm afraid of going up against a demon, but I have never realized how much I depended on this little bit of metal on my finger. To make it worse, I couldn't even be put down anywhere near Arcadium Acres, like Las Vegas, let's say. No, I'm portaled out into the Los Angeles FBI field office, where my official orders state I am to take a car on an investigation. Bureaucracy is bureaucracy in the living world and the afterlife, so no one questions why I am being issued a car in L.A., despite my cover showing me as assigned to the San Francisco office. All I had to do was flash my badge, fill out some papers, and I was on the road. I can see the town up ahead now, the buildings shimmer in the heat. My phone chirps at me from the cup holder. I see Reg's name on the screen. I really don't know if Nevada has a hands-free law or not, but I don't see any cops or anyone around for that matter, so I answer it. New info for me, Reg? The lost hunter is named Emily Adams. Uh, what was she? FBI? Highway Patrol? Journalist. She was supposed to be in town to cover the... Reg pauses for a second as if reading something. The Spring King Fair. King? As in Elvis or royalty? Royalty, it looks like. It was a festival started two years ago by the development company, King's Realm Homes, to try and attract people to the town. I guess it worked. I can almost hear Red shrug over the phone. You might tell people you are investigating her disappearance. She's not checked in with her cover job since she went missing, either. As I talk to Red, I can feel my ring start to tingle warmly on my hand. I see what you mean about the ring. Something's setting it off already. And I'm not even in town yet. Be careful, Dax. We don't need to lose any more agents. Remember that your primary is to eliminate the shapeshifter. But it would certainly look good in your file if you can find out what happened to Agent Adams. You got it, I say. Sounding a lot more confident than I actually feel. The road into town leads right down Main Street. It has that cute faux Americana feel to it like Main Street USA at Disneyland does. The street is lined with shops, a mix of national brands like Apollo Coffee and what I assume are local businesses like bakeries and coffee shops. A few blocks in and this old-fashioned look gives way to more of what I expect to see in a small town nowadays. A strip mall complete with a taco hut, tea mart, and burger bro. The parking lot itself, though, has a small carnival set up in it. Nothing major, just a ferris wheel, merry-go-round, tilt-a-whirl, and bumper cars. 
there's a large banner stretched between two light poles over the carnival that reads, Arcadium Acres Third Annual Spring King Fair. This year's king to be announced Wednesday night. Have you voted? Wednesday, eh? That's tomorrow night. Maybe I can wrap this up and get to enjoy the festivities. I've been wrestling with how to approach this the whole way out here. Part of me says to not go around flashing my badge. It tells me to try and stay under the radar for as long as possible. Of course, another part of me is pointing out that Agent Adams was here as a reporter, and the demon still found her. Was the demon somehow able to pick her out of the crowd, or was her mere presence as an outsider what gave her away to it? Screw subtlety. Let's start with the police. At the center of town, I find a large, grassy roundabout with a stage set up on it. In the center of the stage is a very ornate, if kind of cheap-looking, throne under a large banner reading, Meet the new king of the Spring King Fair this Wednesday, fluttering over it in the light, hot breeze. On the other side of the roundabout was my goal. The city government building is the police station, city hall, chamber of commerce, city council building, and a half a dozen other offices all under one roof. The building is flanked on the right by the town fire department, and on the left by the town medical clinic. The medical clinic in particular strikes me as quaint, but I suppose that being so far from anywhere, Arcadium Acres needs to have at least basic emergency care available. All the city buildings are made from the same light-colored stone, probably to make it easier to cool the building interior during the intensely hot summers here. Flagpoles sporting the American and Nevada state flags sprout up from the roof of each of the three buildings. I pull my car into the parking lot between the government building and the medical clinic and turn it off. The temperature inside the car starts to rise as soon as the air conditioner cuts out. The heat assaults me like a right hook to the face as I get out of the car and run my hands over my pockets in a habit learned through a lifetime of not wanting to lock myself out of my house. Wallet in one pocket, badge in another, gun in its holster, the knife sheath that's small on my back, check, 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 and check. I lock the car, slip my keys into the pocket with my wallet, and head into the building. The police department is not what I expected. It is small, basically just one large room of desks with a few small offices around the edge of it and a public service counter separating me and the small waiting area from the rest of the office. Maybe I just spend too much time in big cities to have a reasonable expectation of what to find in smaller towns. Seeing me come in, one of the officers, a man about five years and twenty pounds past his prime, heaves himself up from his desk and comes over to the counter. How can I help you, sir? He asks in a way that tells me he already knows me to be a stranger. I pull out my badge and ID and flip the leather case open to show it to the local cop. I'm Special Agent Zader Dax. I'm Captain Bill Andros. The cop introduces himself, but does not extend his hand to shake. What brings the FBI out to our little piece of the desert? There's something odd about this cop, but I can't quite place it. I'm investigating the disappearance of a journalist from Los Angeles named Emily Adams... I slip my ID back into my pocket as I speak. Now what makes you think we'd know anything about that here? Her editor said her last assignment was to cover your little spring fair. Son, we're just a small town in the middle of the desert. Don't no one pay any attention out here. I think we got a TV station from Vegas out here last year, but certainly no one from California. It's almost as if he's trying to act like a small-town cop from a TV show. Like this is all an act. Well, our editor told me that Miss Adams checked in from here before she disappeared. Why is the FBI so interested in some girl reporter? How does this even fall under your jurisdiction? We haven't received any calls here looking for her. She crossed state lines before disappearing. I bluff. I don't know if that would really fall under federal jurisdiction or not, and hopefully now that it is Captain Andros. Hmm. Andros grunts, as if thinking. Well, you're welcome to look around. You should come to the Spring King Fair tonight if you decide to stay in town. I might just do that, I reply. Here, then. Andros reaches under the counter for something. My hand twitches to go for my gun, but I don't let it. The cop pulls out a sheet of glossy paper. Chamber of Commerce gives these out to visitors. 
There's directions on here to the hotel if you're staying the night. There should be vacancies since most of the carnies are staying in their own trailers. Okay, that's it. Every instinct I have wants to just grab this guy and knock his head into the counter. But I don't for two reasons. First off, pissing off the local cops is not a good way to start a job. Second, if this guy's not the demon, and I kind of think he isn't, I would just be inviting a large amount of paperwork on myself. Demon or not, there is something very wrong with this guy. The small town cop act is an act, but I'm not sure why. Could this just be the way they treat outsiders? This town seems too new to have developed that kind of isolationist mentality, but maybe it's just him. There's another weird thing about Andros, though. His smile, fake or otherwise, doesn't seem to reach his eyes. It's almost like I'm talking to an animatronic instead of a person. I expected to get some sort of a lead from the police. Being told that Agent Adams has never even been here kind of puts a monkey wrench in my plans. I decide to head to the hotel and get a room. According to the handout that Andros gave me, the Arcadium Acres Motor Lodge is the only hotel in town. I cannot imagine why this cute little town out in the middle of nowhere, south of Vegas, wouldn't get enough tourist traffic to justify having more than one place to stay. Still, if this is the only place for someone from out of town to stay, then Adams would have had to get a room here. If she made it this far. The hotel isn't far from the center of town, and much like Main Street is another retro affair. It looks like the kind of fleabag hotel you see along formerly busy highways that are mostly frequented by prostitutes nowadays. This one looks clean and new, however, and advertises a free breakfast for guests. I don't really need to eat, but I have found that food paid for with agency money does taste better. The desk clerk is a cheery blonde girl, maybe in her early 20s, but she has that same fake feel to her that Andros had. I'm not a paranoid person by nature, but this is starting to give me the creeps. Okay, Agent Dax, you're going to be in room 21 on the second floor, all the way at the right end. It's one of our best rooms. You can see town center from there. You should be able to see the king's throne from there. The girl, with Mindy printed on the badge stuck to her chest, says to me as she processes my credit card. So, how long have you lived here? I ask, trying to make conversation. Oh, my family moved here when they were still building the town. It's nice to be away from Vegas and all of its bad influences, you know? Plus, we're still close enough if we want to go and indulge in a little sin, if you know what I mean. She smiles knowingly at me, but again, nothing behind the eyes. Have you had a lot of visitors in town for the Spring King Fair? Mostly just the carnival people. There are a couple of them here in the hotel and a couple of other people who came for the fair. I bring up a picture of Emily Adams that Red sent to my phone. Agent Adams is a cute woman, looks to be in her mid-thirties and wears black framed glasses. She could certainly pass for a journalist. I show the picture to Mindy. Have you seen this woman at all? Hmm, no, but I can ask Suze or Martin if they've seen anyone like that. Is she your girlfriend? What kind of a question is that, I wondered. No, she's gone missing, and she said she was coming here. This is the only hotel in town, right? Yep, the only and the best. So, if she were going to stay in town, this is where she would stay. Unless she's couch surfing, yep. Mindy hands me a plastic card and a piece of paper. Okay, here you go. Your key and your receipt. If you have any other questions, someone will be right here. Or you can just call us on your room phone. The room is not bad. It's a little small, but modern. I toss aside the bedspread. They never wash those things, you know. And sit on the bed with my laptop and phone. While the computer boots up, I call Reg. Dax, are you making any progress? Reg asks when he answers his phone. No, so far the people I've asked say they've never seen her. I wanted you to check her credit card activity from before she disappeared. To see if she used the card in town? Yeah. Since you guys don't give us cash, she must have used the card for something. The hotel, gas, something. Can you send me what you find? Good thinking. Reg said, and I can hear him typing. Okay, I'm sending it to you. The laptop pings, notifying me of a new email. I open it and find a blank white page. It's blank. Reg lets out an annoyed sigh, and I hear his fingers hitting the keyboard harder. I'm never going to get the hang of these things. How did you do this stuff without computers? We would deliver it in person. It was a lot easier. There. Check now. 
I cannot imagine you outside of that office, I say as the computer pings. The information in the new email shows me that not only did Agent Adams use her card to buy gas in town, but that she also charged a room at this motel to it, and her last charge was on Sunday at Apollo Coffee. Well, that confirms it. She definitely was there. Reg says to me. There's something very wrong with all of this. Why would people lie about her being here? How many people have you asked? Maybe they really didn't see her. I'm sure she didn't speak to everyone in town before she stopped reporting in. The people I've talked to have been... off. Can a shapeshifter possess mortals? Not that I've ever heard of. Why would they need to when they can impersonate them? I'm going to look around some more. I'll check in with you later. I'll be here. And Dax. Yeah? Be careful. Good to know you care. Heading back to Main Street, I decide to retrace Agent Adams' steps to the last place I know she was, Apollo Coffee. The sun is starting to set, and it's beginning to cool a little. But it is still uncomfortably warm in my suit jacket. Unless I want to have my gun and knife visible to everyone, I have no choice but to keep it on. The boy behind the counter at Apollo is the same as Andros and Mindy. He's cheerful and acts like he wants to be helpful enough, but he seems to be not all there. And as he calls his co-workers over to me to see the picture on my phone, they all seem the same way. Can a demon possess multiple hosts at the same time? Of course, none of the coffee jockeys have seen this missing woman. I don't go out of my way to point out how I know she bought coffee here. Or someone did, using her card. But the beeline I made coming here from the hotel probably gives me away. I should have checked a couple of other places first to make it seem like I was just guessing. Still not too late to give that a try, though. Coming out of the Apollo, my eye catches a glint of setting sunlight off something in the gutter. Something metal. I kneel down and find a single shell casing from a 9mm bullet. Now, why is this here? I pocket the casing, not knowing if it has anything to do with Adam's disappearance or not. As the sun falls lower and lower in the sky, I move up one side of Main Street and down the other, asking each store employee if they have seen her. I'm not at all surprised that everyone says no, but they all, every last one of them, seem wrong. As the sun drops behind the buildings, I hear music start up from down the street in the strip mall parking lot as the carnival comes to life. I decide to head in that direction. Kids run and scream around me under the flashing lights of the few rides that are here. There's a trailer selling corn dogs and cotton candy, a booth with two older ladies wearing plastic crowns trying to get people to cast their votes for the king of Arcadia Makers. And even a small stage with a band of some local high school kids playing almost decently. It would bring back the memories of my own childhood if it didn't seem fake. I cannot shake the feeling that they are all watching me. It seems like whenever I turn around, everyone suddenly turns away and resumes whatever they are supposed to be doing. As if it is all a performance being put on for my benefit. Maybe it's paranoia. Maybe they recognize me as an outsider. Maybe it's just the fact that I am the only suit among the t-shirts and jeans, but I don't think so. I walk over to the waist-high railing enclosing the Ferris wheel, pull out my badge, and stick it before the operator's face. You're not from town, right? No way, man. I'm just here with the Midway. I finished my probation, man. I don't want no trouble with the cops. I'm not a cop. I'm a fed. Get it straight. Yeah, sorry, dude. It sounds authentic, but there's that same thing with the eyes. If I hadn't already seen that not-quite-there look from every shop owner on Main Street, I might chalk it up to a trick of the light, or maybe the carny just being stoned. But I know better than that. How long have your people been in town? Carney cocks his head like he's taken offense. My people been here since last Wednesday. We finished setting up on Thursday and passed our inspection. Everything's legal, man. I'm not interested in that. I'm looking for someone. I don't know nothing about no drugs or prostitutes. If it weren't for the ring burning steadily on my finger in reaction to demonic presence somewhere around me, I would have rolled my eyes at that. I'm looking for a reporter who came to town to cover the fair. I bring out my phone and show the carny the picture of Emily Adams. Hey, she's cute, the guy says. She's also missing. I figured she might have come around while your people were setting up to ask questions. Did you see her? 
No, I ain't seen no one asking no questions except the inspector. He don't look nothing like her. This is getting frustrating. I know that randomly asking people if they've seen her is hardly the best way to go about this. But I don't know what to do at this point. I have never had this much trouble tracking someone down. Especially when I know where they disappeared from. I thank the carney for his time and turn around to find a flock of children, preteens, maybe between ages 10 and 12, standing behind me. They're looking at me without trying to hide it at all. The tallest one looks to be about 12, steps away from the group towards me. He's wearing a white t-shirt with the words, Vote for Glenn Gervais, written on it in puffy paint. Hey, mister. The kid begins. Have you voted for King yet? No. Then you should vote for me. The kid steps forward and slaps something on my chest. I look down to see a white rectangular sticker, the kind you would use for printing mailing labels, stuck to my chest. On the sticker, written in red marker, are the words, I support Glenn Gervais. Why should I vote for you? I would be the youngest king yet, and I think I'd be a good king. Uh, what policies do you support? Huh? The kid, Glenn, I suppose, asks... This kid is different than the others. He seems more real. Not like he's just acting out a role. I pull out my phone and show him the picture of Agent Adams. I'll vote for you if you answer a question for me. Have you seen this woman in town at all? Kid's eyes go wide. Um, no. He says rapidly. I haven't seen anyone like that. He's lying, and he's not good at it. I want to call him on it, but I think he's lying because of the kids with him. This is the first person I've run across today that does not seem to be possessed or otherwise under control of the demon. I make a note of his name in my mind to try to track him down later when I can talk to him without an audience. Okay, I say, and start around the kids in the direction of the voting booth. I pick up one of the ballots from the stack on the table and one of the stubby little golf pencils in the box next to them, write Glenn's name on the paper, fold it, and stuff it into the plastic storage bin labeled Ballot Box. Thanks, mister. The kid calls to me, and the group of kids leave. Realizing that I'm not going to get any more information tonight, I decide to head back to the hotel. As I head back to my car, I notice that people are watching me a little more openly now. Was it my interaction with the kid that caused this? I think the kid may be immune to whatever this demon is doing to the townspeople. I need to talk to this kid again. Back at the hotel, I check in with Reg, telling him about the kid. I think this kid knows something. He's certainly different than the others. Well, it's something to go on, at least. I've been doing some research, and I think maybe the people you're dealing with are enthralled. Enthralled? A sort of mystical enslavement, like hypnotism, but more complex. They're not really possessed, but their free will is still being overridden. Wonderful. I guess that means they're going to be protecting the demon from me, then. I would think so. And just what do I do if they attack me? They're still innocent, Zader. You can't kill them. So you keep your gun holstered until you can use it on the demon. So I'm in a town full of potential attackers who have already taken out one hunter, and I cannot defend myself. You cannot kill or cripple them. Not unless you want to spend the next year filling out reports about it. What if I just make it so they limp a little? You do what you have to do to complete this mission. I'll fight for you. But just keep in mind that I'm a nobody in the grand scheme, okay? Listen, I want you to look up this kid for me. I look down at the sticker still on the front of my coat. His name's Glenn Gervais. All right, give me a minute. His fingers rack attack on the keyboard. You know, if you would just give me full database access from the laptop, I wouldn't need to bug you for stuff like... A knock at the door stops me in mid-sentence. Shit, I mutter, pulling my gun. Language. There's someone here. Isn't it almost 11 there? Yeah, I'll call you later, Reg. Get out from behind that desk for a while. I slip the phone into my pocket and grip the gun tightly in my hand. I know I'm not going to be using it on whatever's behind the door because it's not like the demon's going to come to my hotel room and say hi. But I should be able to dissuade anyone from doing anything too stupid just by pointing it at them. Who is it? I say in my most menacing tone. It's me, Mr. Glenn from the fair. Comes a hushed young voice from the other side. You gotta let me in before anyone sees me here. I sigh and holster my gun. I open the door a crack to see that the kid is alone on the balcony that runs the length of the second floor of the motel. 
I can see down below that the parking lot is empty, too. Thanks, mister. The kid says as I step aside and allow him entry. How did you know where to find me? They've all been talking about you. Plus, this is the only place to stay, so... The kid trails off. Glenn moves farther into my room, standing between me and the small table by the window with my laptop sitting on it. So, why did you want to see me? The lady you were asking about? I couldn't say anything in front of the others. I'm afraid of what they'll do to me. Where is Miss Adams? What's going on around here? They took her, Glenn explains. Last week, everyone started acting weird. It was just a few kids at school at first. But soon, everyone was acting like that. I think I'm the last one left. I'm scared they're gonna... The window behind Glenn explodes inward and he stops talking. His eyes go wide as I see a dark, wet flower begin to bloom on the front of his t-shirt. I catch him as he starts to pitch forward and slowly lower him to the ground. I check his neck and find no pulse. My ring is burning hotter than ever now. It's as if the demon were right here with me. But there's no one here but me and a murdered child. I think I may be in some serious trouble here. Rushing to the window, I can see people moving around out on the street behind the motor lodge. There's a large truck parked out there and a man standing on top of it. There's a flash from the man and I feel something hit me in the chest hard enough to make me stagger a step. I look down and see a bullet hole in the front of my shirt with blood spreading out of it. Was it a trap? Were they waiting to see if he would come to me? Or were they planning to try and kill me and he just made for a lucky twofer? I ignore the pain in my chest, he can't kill me that easy, and run for the door. I throw open the door to find Mindy, the desk clerk, standing there smiling at me and holding a shotgun. I dodge to the right as she fires both barrels at me. I manage to dodge some of the buckshot, but not all of it. My face and chest feel like they're on fire as the small metal spheres tear into my flesh. Luckily, my eyes manage to escape any damage, and I can still see. I grab the barrel of the shotgun, the hot metal burning my right hand, and yank it towards me. Mindy staggers into the room, and right into my left fist, which knocks the smile off her face as she collapses to the carpet unconscious. Someone else is in the doorway now. White tank top, mullet, I'm guessing he's one of the carnies. He's holding a crowbar, and he comes at me with it. If the demon is controlling them somehow, I don't know why he thinks a crowbar will succeed where two guns fail. Wielding the shotgun in both hands like a staff, I block the carney's swing of the crowbar and shove him back into the doorway where he runs into another person, a teenager in the hideous multicolored uniform of Taco Hut. The kid staggers back into and then falls over the railing. He never yells out as he falls, but I hear him thud solidly on the parking lot below. Not my fault, I yell out towards the ceiling. I'm screwed with the paperwork now. I sock the carney in the face with the butt of the shotgun and he drops to the floor of the walkway. I step out of my room to find the rest of the walkways clogged with people. At the front is a police officer I haven't seen before. He fires his service pistol, putting another hole in my already hurting chest. This one pierced a lung, and I can feel the organ deflating in my chest. I don't, strictly speaking, need to breathe to survive, but it always bothers me when I can't. Rather than fight my way through the crowd of possessed, sorry, enthralled people, I leap over the railing, landing hard on the ground next to the bleeding Taco Hut kid. I don't quite stick the landing, but I stay on my feet. People start coming out of the first floor motel room, various improvised weapons in hand as I try to make it to my car. Fuck! I yell when I get to the car and find the tires flat. Not that it really matters since I left the keys on the dresser in my room. I'm surrounded now, and the once peaceful people of Arcadia Makers close in on me. They form a circle around me in the car, staying back far enough that I can't hit them with a the shotgun. We are at a standoff. They can't take me, but I can't take them out. They surround me, all grinning, but other than the sound of their breathing, they are silent. I glare at them, looking from face to face. A young woman in a Maneki Neko and the Chanchu's t-shirt. A balding older man in a shirt and tie. A young child with an I Support Glenn Gervais sticker on his chest. They all smile back like this was all a game. I try to inventory my possible escape routes. I could try to go through them. I don't care what's controlling them. I can take a group of untrained mortals. 
but the paperwork, if I badly injure any of them, would be horrendous. I look up. I could climb the car and jump back to the walkway on the second floor, but it's still clogged with more weapon-toting locals. I could try to jump from the top of the car over the crowd, but I don't think I would make it. The silence is broken by the sound of an engine. I can see headlights behind the group in front of me, and they're getting closer. Somehow, I doubt this is the cavalry coming to my rescue, especially since I am the cavalry. It's something big. The engine is definitely diesel by the sound of it. As if it has all been rehearsed, the crowd clears a path open in front of me, and the headlights of a very large semi pulling a silver tanker that shines in the moonlight momentarily blind me. The truck is coming fast. I need to move, but where? I jump up onto the hood of my car and then onto the roof. I intend to leap onto the front of the truck before it impacts and then try to leap clear before it sandwiches me between either my car or the front of the motel. I barely hear the shot from someone's pistol, but I feel it slam into my right leg and hit the bone. It is an incredible shot against a moving target, but someone, one of the cops I'm guessing, pulled it off. My leg gives out and I fall off the roof of my rental car and right into the path of the oncoming truck. I pull myself to my feet and try to leap again, but I'm too late. The last thing I see is blindingly bright lights before the grinning grill of the truck slams into me. I am damn near invincible. And that's not boasting. But one of the few truths in life is that you can incapacitate pretty much anything, living, dead, or otherwise, by hitting it with a truck. I have just enough time to remember that this is a pretty similar experience to my mortal death before the darkness overwhelms me and I lose consciousness. Oi! I hear a woman's voice hissing. Everything hurts. I try to move and find my arms are secured behind my back. I can feel the metal cuffs digging into my wrists when I pull. Try to move my legs and find them to be similarly shackled together. Come on, you still can't be unconscious. What did they do, hit you with a truck? Yeah, actually, I groan. I open my eyes and squint against the harsh fluorescent lights set inside the wire cage on the ceiling. I am in a sitting position, my back propped up against a cold, hard wall. I look around and find that I am sitting on a bunk in a jail cell. No doubt below the same police station I was in earlier today. Or was it yesterday? How long was I out? So are you my backup then? I look at the source of the voice. I recognize her instantly despite the fact one of the lenses on her glasses is shattered and that the hair on her head is largely matted instead of curly like it is in the picture. There's dried blood on her face and staining her white blouse in the front of her blue jeans. Her clothes are speckled with what look like bullet holes. She is sitting on the bunk opposite me in the same cell, her hands behind her back and her ankles shackled together. Emily Adams? I ask. I guess that answers my question. So who are you? Special Agent Zader Dax, FBI. Oh, you can drop your cover. They know who we are. Did they get your weapons? I don't feel the weight of my gun on my side. I feel for my knife, but find it missing also. The chain between the handcuffs on my wrists clanks softly as I feel the small of my back for the missing weapon. Losing your weapon is a big deal for an agent, and for me personally. I've been told by other agents that our weapons could even banish an angel to hell, but I have my doubts about that. Shit, yeah, I groan embarrassed as much as anything. Don't worry about it. They got my gun, too. So how long did it take before you knew something was wrong? The first person I talked to seemed odd, and the second... I started to put things together once I realized that everyone was that way, not just those two people. How long was I out? Emily jingles her handcuff chains. I can't exactly look at my watch, but I'd say a good five or six hours at least. It's kind of hard to keep track of time in here. So how'd they get you anyway? I'm sure if you came in here flashing a badge that it didn't take them long to figure out who you really are. There was this kid who seemed immune to the demon's control. He came to me for help. They killed him. And then tried to capture me. And that's when they hit you with a truck? Yeah. 
What happened to you? I'd been in town a couple of days. Now, I know what you mean about people seeming odd, but it wasn't everyone. I think it takes time for the demon to gain control over more people. And I think that's what's setting my ring off, because it's a lot stronger now than when I first got here. I'd gone into Apollo's for a cup of coffee, and when I came out, there were three police officers there, guns drawn. They started shooting, I tried to run, they ran me down with a car, broke my legs, and had me tied up before I could recover. I pull against my handcuffs. They don't feel any stronger than standard police handcuffs. With a little effort, I should be able to break the chain linking them together. I then wonder why Agent Adams is still here. Your cuffs? I ask, jingling mine. Yeah. She nods, understanding my full question. But where would I go at this point? I don't know about you, but I couldn't get through those bars. I nod back. Time is something agents of purgatory have plenty of, so we can wait. We don't have to wait too long, though. It's been maybe ten hours of just me and Agent Adams talking. I'm back to 100% now, and I could snap these cuffs as soon as an opportunity presents itself. I hear footsteps coming down into the police station's holding area. A lot of them. Captain Bill Andros leads a dozen khaki-clad police officers toward our cell. All but one of them has their weapons drawn. Time to move, demon hunters. We wouldn't want you to miss the crowning of the king. Adams was right. It's hard to keep track of time down here. If they are getting ready to crown the king, that means I've been down here closer to 20 hours than the 15 I had been estimating. In Andros's hand, I can see my agency-issued gun. In the hands of a female officer next to him, identified as Wahoviak by the patch above her breast pocket, is what looks like a civilian stun gun. I look at Adams questioningly. Adams shrugs. Yeah, it's mine. It's not like I can carry around a pistol with me, now is it? A younger officer with short blonde hair unlocks the door to our cell. Now you two are going to behave, or I'm going to use this. Andros threatens. And then you can see what hell is like firsthand. It'll probably take your arm off if you do, I caution. That little gun has quite a kick. I appreciate your concern, but I think you'll be a little too gone to care if that happens. Neither myself nor Agent Adams make any threatening moves, while the cops move to one side of the hallway to allow me and Adams to shuffle walk out as best as our ankle restraints will allow us. There is an elevator they could use to get us back up to ground level, but the cops don't lead us there. I don't know if they just don't want to be in such a tight space with us, or if the demon just wants to laugh at us while we try to climb stairs with our ankles chained together. But it is the stairs we are led to. Andros waits at the top of the stairs while Wahoviak stands at the bottom. They both keep the weapons trained on us as we make the slow, awkward climb. Even if we did try to make an escape while in this stairwell, we would have nowhere to go without going through one of them and risking getting our own weapons used on us. It is already dark when we are led outside, but it's still quite warm. In the distance, I can hear music blaring from the carnival, but looking around, it seems like everyone in town is here. The circle of road with its island of grass in the center is full of people, all smiling and standing silently, facing the stage with its gaudy throne on it. The stage is all lit up from spotlights mounted on poles at the corners of the stage. A path opens for us as the police lead us around to the front side of the stage so that we can see the front of the throne. I clench my teeth at what I see. I look over to find a look of surprise on Adam's face. On this stage, propped up in the throne of gold spray paint and plastic gems, is the dead body of Glenn Gervais. His head hangs limply against his left shoulder. I pull on my restraints harder. Yes, I can get free, but who do I attack? The demon must be here, but who? I can't simply start laying waste to everyone in this town. Whatever I'm going to do, I need to get my gun back. Adam's gun, too. A pudgy man with thinning gray hair climbs up onto the stage from the set of stairs on the right side. He is wearing an immaculate black tuxedo. He approaches the microphone set up next to the throne with its dead occupant. All right, it looks like everyone is here now, so let's get started. All of the votes have been tallied, and it is time to crown this year's Spring King Fair King. The crowd cheers in unison. Yay! It's like listening to a recording of one person cheering played a thousand times over and at different pitches. 
a thousand different voices making the same exact noise, right down to the same inflection, at once. If my blood wasn't already boiling with rage, I would probably find this chilling. If I may have the envelope, please, the man says into the microphone. A young, red-haired girl with a sash reading Miss Arcadium Acres across her chest comes on stage. She has a small white envelope in one hand and a large shiny crown in the other. Here you go, Mr. Mayor, the girl says and smiles at the crowd. This time, everyone whoops in unison at the pretty girl. Not like they mean it, but like they're a bunch of bad actors following a well-rehearsed script. The mayor makes a big show of opening the envelope and holds up the paper inside like he's trying to read it in the spotlight. And the 2011 king of Arcadia Makers is... Glenn Gervais with over 99% of the vote! Yeah! A thousand voices cheer the same cheer again as Miss Arcadium Acres walks over, lifts the dead child's head off his shoulder, and places the crown gently on it before letting it slump over again. This is really fucked up. I barely hear Adam say next to me. Let's hear it for King Glenn the First! The mayor roars into the microphone. <laughs> Chants the crowd. I've just about had enough of this. None of the demon's puppets are paying any attention to us now. They are all too busy cheering for the dead body on the stage. I look to my side and see that Adams has spotted this opportunity too, and has snapped the chain joining her wrists. Long live the king! Long live the king! I jerk violently against the chains as hard as I can, and they break as if they were made of string instead of metal. The shackles on my ankles are a little harder, but a couple of hard jerks snaps them as well. This is all too easy, and I can't help but wonder if the shapeshifter, or whatever it is, wants us to get free. Long live the king! Long live the king! Andros is standing in front of me, chanting along with the crowd. I wrap my left forearm around his throat and pull back hard. I grab his right wrist the one still holding my gun, with my free hand, but he doesn't even try to bring it up to fire. After a few moments, he goes limp in my arm and I drop him to the ground. When I straighten back up after retrieving my gun, I look over to see Adam standing over the unconscious body of Officer Wachowiak. In the light from the stage, I can see that her cop has blood flowing from a likely broken nose. Now what? Adams asks. Who is it? It has to be here, so who is it? That's the question, isn't it? A voice asks over the stage's speakers. But it's not the mayor's voice. I recognize the voice. It belongs to... <gasps> the kid! Gasps Adams, pointing with her stun gun. I look, and there on the stage, in his own blood-stained t-shirt, is Glenn Gervais, standing at the microphone, grinning. He looks taller now, as if he has stretched out to match the height of the mic stand instead of lowering it down to his level. His shirt stops a couple of inches short of the waistband of his jeans, which themselves stop a couple of inches above his sneakers. Oh, but you've gone and figured it out now, Glenn says. I raise my gun, but the mayor and the beauty queen step into my line of fire. Now, now, you cannot assassinate the king on the first night of his reign. You came to Earth and took over an entire town just so you could be named king of some stupid street fair? A wise man once said that it is better to reign on earth than to serve in hell. That's not how the saying goes. Do you contradict the king? Glenn asks. Well, let's put it to the people. My followers, is that the correct saying? Yes, my liege, the crowd replies in unison. The people have spoken. It's good to be the king. I thought you were supposed to be a form mutator or something. I ask, how are you controlling these people? I've learned a few things along the way, Glenn replies proudly. And it's not just this town, you know. Already my followers are spreading my influence across the state. Soon I will be the king of Nevada, then the West, then the country. The crowd cheers. Oh, great. Adams mutters. He's a cartoon villain. But I guess you want to see me do some shape-shifting, is that it? Okay. Glenn's features melt, and he grows a little taller. His hair lengthens, and his shirt stretches out as breasts grow beneath it. Suddenly, a perfect copy of Emily Adams stands on the stage. Is this better? The demon asks in Emily's voice. 
His features melt again, and he grows taller still, his shirt stretching so much that pieces of the puffy paint lettering on it break off. Suddenly, I am standing there in jeans and a t-shirt that are stretched out like sausage skins. How about this? The demon asks, in my voice. What about animals? Adams asks, working her way into the crowd and towards the stairs on the right of the stage. Her stun gun has been shoved into one of her pants pockets, and instead she is just holding a silver retractable ballpoint pen, which she is clicking nervously. Now, Emily, may I call you Emily? I just feel like I know you well enough for that, Demon Me asks. I start to make my way through the crowd, too, heading for the left, looking for a clear shot. More of the controlled mortals move to stay between me and the stage. If you like, Emily says. The crowd lets her pass, lets her walk right up to the stage. I just want to know what the range of your abilities are. I've never seen a shapeshifter before. Demon me shakes a finger at her. I know that story. You want me to turn into a mouse or a fly or something so you can just step on me. I'm not that stupid. Thank you very much. Adams climbs up onto the stage, keeping her hands well away from the gun tucked into her pocket. I would never try something that cliche. And it wouldn't work anyway. We both know that. I cannot figure out what Adams' game is here. If she's trying to distract the demon to give me a shot, it's not working. The civilians continue to place themselves between me and my target. And unless I want to shoot through them, I will not be able to pull this off. Can you change into something else? Adams asks, looking up at the demon's copy of my face a full foot above hers. That is very disconcerting. I suppose I can grant such a small request to a follower. The demon's features again melt. He grows shorter less muscular, and now Adams is standing right in front of a handsome man with slicked back brown hair. His clothes are still too small for him, but no longer look like they are threatening to tear. Is that better? The demon asks, in a smooth new voice. Is this shape more appealing to you? No. I thought you were better looking the other way, Adams says, stepping right up in front of the shapeshifter. But you are shorter this way which makes it easier for me. For what? To kiss me? Come on, give me some sugar, baby. Adams chuckles. <laughs> no, I don't think so. It makes it easier for me to do this! I can barely see her over the heads of the townspeople trying to keep me from a clear shot, but Adam's right hand becomes a blur of motion as she stabs the demon in the throat with a pen she had been fidgeting with. I am surprised to see a flash of bright red flames spray out of the small hole under the demon's handsome face. The demon staggers back from Adams, its hands coming up to try and stop the flames gushing from its neck wound. Its features blur and darken and it starts to grow. Its fingers turn black and lengthen into claws as it grows taller and taller, shredding the child-sized clothing it was wearing. <laughs> The shapeshifter lets out an inhuman roar as Adams leaps up onto it and drives her pen into its chest. The demon topples backwards to the floor of the stage as all of the townspeople turn and rush toward it, obscuring my view of the fight as they race to help their king. I start pushing my way forward to where Agent Adams and the demon are buried under a pile of innocence, throwing the demon's puppets aside like they're rag dolls as I fight my way towards the woman I was originally sent to rescue. I'm up on the stage only a couple of yards away from where I know Agent Adams went down when it happens. I cannot see it, but I know Adams has pierced the demon's heart with her pen, and it finally clicks for me. The pen is her backup weapon. Of course, what else would a writer have? There's a bright flash, and I am thrown backwards into a shower of bodies as bright red flame shoots skyward. I can see the silhouettes of townspeople flying through the air before my vision is obscured by people landing on me. I know it is over when the burning sensation for my ring suddenly ceases. I am buried in a pile of motionless bodies. I note the strong smell of brimstone in the air as I pull myself out of the heap and start making my way to where Adams was. All of the spotlights were blown out by the force of the demon's explosion, so I can now see only by moonlight. I am only a little surprised to find an open circle in the middle of the piles of bodies with a small pile of ashes with tattered pieces of clothing in them. 
See? Agent Adams' voice comes from behind me. The pen really is mightier than the sword. I turn to see Adams standing out on the grass surrounded by more bodies. She is holding her hand up in the air. It's too dim to see, but I'm sure she's holding her pen up. I find that my phone has not survived the activities of the last 24 hours. So Adams walks back to the police station to call Reg while I check the bodies. To my great relief, I find that everyone I check is breathing, but unconscious. I don't know if there will be any permanent damage to their minds or bodies, but at least I don't find any dead ones to have to write reports on. Adams makes her way back over to me after coming out of the police station. Is this yours? She asks, holding a knife and a black sheath out to me. Yeah, I say, taking it from her. So what did Reg say? He wasn't there. I got Rose. Adams rolls her eyes as she says the name of Reg's less than pleasant receptionist. Thracken actually got out from behind that desk? Where is he? Rose wouldn't say. She just says, he's out. Not wanting to talk about Rose and end up getting a rant fest going, I change the subject. So, the pen, that's your... My backup? Yeah. It's a lot easier to explain having a ballpoint pen than it is explaining away carrying a large knife in my purse. How did you get it past the demon's followers? I told them the nail file in my purse was my backup. It's not like Gervais had any way of proving it short of stabbing me or himself. They let me keep my wallet, too. Want to see if Apollo's is out? Adam stops talking and looks up. We both hear it. A motor in the distance. Crap. She groans, and then, motioning to the bodies littering the park. I do not want to have to try and explain this to a mortal. The motor grows louder, and suddenly a spotlight appears in the sky. Its beam searching the ground, the light darts back and forth across the unconscious townsfolk before finding and stopping on me and Agent Adam. We both put our hands up to shield our eyes, and the large black helicopter hovers over a clear piece of road and ropes spiral out of it. Men in riot armor and helmets start sliding down the ropes to the street and immediately begin checking the bodies. One of the armored men calmly approaches us as the helicopter rises back into the air and flies away. A little late for the cavalry to come riding to the rescue? The familiar voice asks. The man flips the visor on his helmet up to reveal the serious face of Reginald Thracken. Zader, Emily, you guys look horrible. He says, matter-of-factly. I look down at myself and for the first time realize that I must look worse than Adam's. My shirt and jacket are dark with dried blood and practically shredded from a combination of shotgun pellets and being on the wrong end of a big rig. You should see the other guy. Adam's quips. So, what are we going to do about all this? I ask, motioning to the field of unconscious mortals. We'll call it a chemical spill or something. That's for the people higher up than me to decide. You two, however, have reports to start on. The chopper is landing over by that Ferris wheel. It'll take you to a portal so you can get back. You know, some people get rewards for this sort of thing. Adams complains, but without dropping the smile from her face. You'll get your reward eventually, says Reg. And guys, I'm glad you're both okay. Good job, both of you. I couldn't have done it without my big, strong hero here. Adam says and throws an arm around me just above my waist. Without you being all big and menacing over there, making me look all small and harmless, he never would have let me get so close. We should be friends. Friends, huh? I've never really had friends. Why not? It could be fun. Adams and I start to go in the direction of the carnival. Do you think we could get some cotton candy before we go? She asks me. I shrug. We can see, I say, as we head toward the flashing lights and the blaring music in the distance. Author's Note When I first heard the prompt for this year's Broken Mirror Story event, I was a little worried, and it took a few days to come up with a workable idea, but I liked the challenge of it, and I can always use more practice writing. The first idea I had was going to be something involving Elvis. After almost immediately dismissing that idea, I thought of doing a story set in the same timeline as Mallville, A Journal of the Zombie Apocalypse. 
it was going to be a backstory for the character Pippa, involving her high school's prom king trying to lead her and a group of friends out of the Bay Area and to somewhere safe. But then I had another idea. I had just finished writing a story called Dax the Hunter, which is a much longer version of a flash piece that I had written. Dax is an offshoot of a story that I had started to write about a half a dozen years ago, but ended up abandoning about 30 pages in. I had a lot of fun writing Dax and decided I should try doing something with him. Obviously, this was the right decision. I want to thank Big, Rish, and everyone who took part in the judging who enjoyed Dax Plays Fair. And I hope that you all enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed writing it. Hopefully this will not be the last time you hear my name. All right, everybody. Welcome back. Hope you uh, had a good time with that one. Thank you, Void. V-O-I-D. Now, what was weird is it was capital V-O-I-D. All caps, V-O-I-D. Right. So that is a very interesting name. Avoid Munashi, and I'll bet there's an interesting story behind it, but that's a story for another time. Yeah, another I think episode. so. T- the, the story was a little long. So we probably oughtn't patter on about everything and anything. Then again, why the hell not? It's not like we've got a time limit on the show. <laughs> well, it, uh, from the last comment I read on our blog, uh, nobody is listening now anyway. Ah. So. Right. You said something interesting, and I don't know if I felt the same way until you said it. But once you'd said it about this story, I agreed wholeheartedly. Oh, right. Yeah, it was interesting. When I first started reading the story, it seemed like he still thought that the Broken Mirror event was last year's theme rather than this year's theme. And then it it also included this year's. So maybe it was a, a combo of both themes in one. And, uh, hey, announcer man, do you want to remind people what last year's uh, Broken Mirror Story event uh, premise was? No! Okay. <laughs> All right, O.T., do you remember what it was? Not only no, but hell no. Oh, you don't remember. See, I told you he was faulty and a douchebag. Uh, <laughs> the uh, premise last year was someone arrives in town and discovers that everyone is exactly the same. So you can kind of see that going on in this town, in this story. And then right. this year's premise was a child is proclaimed king. Or queen. But it turns out to be more than just a game. So I think you can find satisfaction in both of those premises. Yeah, I think so too. That all the people being controlled by the same demon definitely makes them all the same, I suppose. Especially in mind, if not in body. This story totally reminded me of last year's very first chemo story, The the Town of Golden Woods. Ah, yes. In that, it was a mission. Go to a town, see what's going on, try and recover an agent. Uh, everybody's the same. But it was also part of a greater whole. This is one adventure with a backstory that we don't know, an organization that's built in a way that we don't understand. We don't have all the pieces. I wouldn't be surprised if Munashi has several of these stories I, about the demon. I hope so. This is a really interesting idea, the whole thing of purgatory agents coming to Earth to get rid of demons that are effing things up all around and... I was really uh, intrigued by this whole thing. Plus, you got to read the main character again, just like Kimo. <laughs> there you go. That's so, what makes it exactly the same. Wait, oh, you needed to be so much more Burke-like for uh, <laughs> for that. I don't think Burke showed up in the second Kimo story. Uh, but this character the, that I played, you know, I didn't really know how to play the guy. Is he a demon also? Is he higher up on the food chain as a demon? than what? Hey, what's the name of your main character, that funny name? Zader Dax or Dax Zader. Oh, look, I am Dax Zader. A young Jedi named Dax Zader, who was a pupil of mine until he turned to evil. Yes. I see. I didn't really know much about this character, and it may be that I did it totally wrong. We'll find out that he's a multi-horned, winged monstrosity <laughs> from a lo- much lower level of hell than <laughs> Dax Zader is. It's like, oh, shoot. I don't I think they're actually... done him with a Scottish accent. <laughs> I don't think they're actually in hell. I think they're still in purgatory, which is different, right? Purgatory yeah. oh. is like where you're waiting to work out your sins or something like that. Or I'm not Catholic, so I don't know the whole... I have heard about Did Dante's you? Inferno and stuff. So, uh, you know, I, there are levels. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if that's 
No, the Dante's Inferno Anything. is hell. It's it's, it's not right. like purgatory or yelly related. Uh, I don't know. Do we want to get into religion <laughs> again? <laughs> no, that's not where I was trying to go. Oh, and I, I'm uh, just saying. Well, I grab don't, the I, wheel. Come on. Arr! There's an embankment coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just trying to say I don't understand this stuff, but purgatory and hell are different, right? And there's limbo too, which is also different. But I don't, I don't understand really the. I, I don't know if you do either, because I know you're also not Catholic. So why I'm asking you about it, I don't know. I guess I'm Catholicer than you are. We'll, oh, we'll put okay. it that way. Uh, let's just move on. There are questions to be answered, and and details to be provided. You know, and maybe there will be future stories that will fill in those gaps. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> I know this is the stupidest thing I may admit to on this show, but you know what? I saw that guy, that character that you played as in my head. <laughs> No. But like, wait, let me guess. Danny DeVito. No, not even close. Oh, okay. Uh, for some reason, I, I saw him in my head as Monterey Jack from the Rescue Rangers. <laughs> Just a fat dude with a big mustache. He wouldn't go crazy and go, geez. But, you know, for some reason, I saw him looking like that guy. A human version of that guy, maybe. Big fat guy with a big mustache. You never mentioned this to me. I, I think... <laughs> I think I could have played it more mustachey. Yeah. yeah. I think I got that more from your reading of it than uh, from the actual text. So it probably was okay. Well mustached. Are you ever going to grow a mustache for the show? Of course. I've been trying. Doesn't it look good? I haven't shaved for weeks. I just love the idea of radio guys <laughs> growing facial hair. He's like, what do you think? Okay, maybe all of this needs to be deleted. I think Rish is right. Okay, well, tell me what you think about the story. Was there anything interesting about it? I found that I enjoyed it more the second time, knowing what was going on, knowing that this boy was no good, was the one, right? and all that. There's that great line when the boy gets shot, and you totally don't pay any attention, because he's already said, you know, his ring is burning all the time when he's in the town. But then there's that part where the boy comes to his hotel room and he gets shot and he catches the boy or whatever. And he's got him there and he's like, my ring was burning more than ever. <laughs> it was like the devil was right there with me. And yeah, I love that line the second time through. And you're like, oh, yeah. I, get, I think that's a sign of a good story, too, when you read it through the second time and find things like that that make it richer. Uh, I remember once... Uh, Tobias Bakel had talked about his whole journey from being a Joe Schmo kind of guy like me and you to being a published author that has novels under his belt and stuff. And one of the things that he said is that, you know, he used to write his stories where it was all building up to that big reveal at the end kind of a thing. And he would purposely leave people in the dark here and there so that there was no possibility of his ending being blown by somebody figuring it out early or something like that. And at a certain point, he realized that his story needed to be interesting when you read it through the second time or the third time, as well as, you know, interesting that first time. So, you know, he didn't want to blow his reveal or anything like that, but can't be deliberately obtuse when you're writing a story because all that's going to do is just keep pissing people off as you keep saying oh yes and there was this but i'm not going to tell you about it at a certain point when people just keep seeing that again and again they're just like oh f you then i'm not gonna read your story anymore and so giving clues like that it felt like the demon was right there with him kind of a thing it's easy for a regular reader to just throw that away and think oh yeah well it seems like it but we know this guy's dead so it can't be him or whatever that makes the story the better the second time around, exactly like Tobias Bakel was saying. Lock up your wives and daughters. I'm going for a smoke break. Well, I think that he pulled it off, uh, as yeah, I was going too. to say, or maybe I already said. Um, I'm, I'm curious. Bring on more. I think it's cool and it's fun and uh, obviously a talented writer. Uh, I think we mentioned last week that people voted independently of one another and this story ended up in the top three. Even though it was long. <laughs> yeah. um, this one had to be put in the novelette category instead of the short story category. Do we have a lot of novelettes? Not very many. Four or five, maybe. Cool. What was A uh, Place So Foreign? That was a novelette. That oh, was, we've not done a novella. That was pushing the limit, but it was still a novelette. I think you have to be over 17,500 words to be a novella. What we was this one? We haven't gone there yet. This one was 10,000 words. 
ten thousand. We could almost buy our own ship for that. <laughs> Star <laughs> Wars, <laughs> really? I'm sorry, it's it's a generational thing, announcer man. Yeah, seriously. If we were doing "Gone with the Wind" quotes, he might be down with it. Yeah, my Ashley will come for me. <laughs> You're mocking me, aren't you? All right, folks. Normally we'd save this for that gets my goat, but I figured I would say something before it becomes too dated. Uh huh. Almost at the very end of November, Warner Brothers, the studio who have completely effed up Superman and all DC Universe I've franchises heard of them. I've except heard of them, yeah. for Batman, because Batman is the only thing that matters. It's not like Superman hasn't saved the world countless times. He saved your life and my life tons of times over but no they don't care he didn't even make any money when he was saving the world from solomon Grundy. that's right sometimes i despair the world will never see another man like him solomon grundy say they are ears oh okay well you would know i don't like warner brothers much but they didn't f up the harry potter franchise so probably because brits have something to do with that and they suck less than we do hey hey come on man let's let's not go there with the jingoism uh was he Boba Fett's father is that? I I don't know what that word is, but don't go there. Okay, won't do that. Probably. What about Green Lantern? We don't know if they've effed that up. Yet. Oh, they have CG costume, but you know the Batman Begins costume was shit, and nobody ever made a problem with that. No, nobody. All they cared about was the brown cape on the Superman costume. Way better costume than the Batman one, but no, no, nobody cares. Anyhow, our beloved friends over at Warner Brothers have announced. That they're going to do a theatrical reboot of the ancient franchise known as Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, come on! You see, many, many years ago, when you lads were all just sperm, there was a movie called Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And generations have passed and been influenced by it. And It's time for it to be rebooted and made relevant today. Pee Wee Herman was in that movie. Was he? Yeah. Oh, that's right. He died for like 47 yeah, minutes. Yeah, he kept going, oh, oh. You have no idea how much thrashing you is going to improve my day. So, yes, they're, and they're, they're going to make it modern, unlike the period piece that the old one was. <laughs> and they're going to make it sexy. Ooh. Lord, no. And uh, they're, they're going to have Christy Swanson in it? That would do it, but no. Oh. They're going to make it soon. Uh, they're going to make it without Joss Whedon. It's fine. You know what? I hope you die. Oh, they did that with the last movie, didn't they? He wrote the first movie, then they took it and made it a comedy, and, uh, you know, I'm sure he still got checks from it. Which is always nice. And then their series was made, and they had uh, executive producers, the people who made the film, who didn't have to do anything, but they got a check every single week for having made the film. I don't want any trouble. And for having screwed Joss out of the film. Yeah, but, uh, you know, let's not feel too bad. I'm sure Buffy the Vampire series, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the series. Buffy the Vampire series, I like that. Okay, I'm sure Buffy the Vampire series made Joss a tremendous amount of money. Oh, yes. Because he was the driving force on that show. He owns all of the characters, save the title character, because they were all created for the television series. So this new reboot will be a, a reboot of the film. You know, I can't have Giles or, or Willow or Spike or Angel. What was the name of the Giles in the film? I don't know. Donald Sutherland played Yeah, him. Donald Sutherland's... Merrick, I believe. Oh, he wasn't Giles? Okay. The film won't have any of those people in it then? I, I imagine it could have Merrick. No, um, I mean Giles and, and all them. It won't have any of them? Shoot, what was Luke Perry's character's name? It was something awful like Finn or... Yeah, it was Pike. Pike. Oh, gosh. Because <laughs> um, it was a fish. Uh, so they're not going to have any of that, huh? That's interesting. I'm, well, and, I'm surprised that uh, they'll still have to pay Joss for using his idea, right? Or no? You know, these are things that I don't understand. You know, the the Marvel comics films can be made without ever crediting the creators. All they contractually have to say is based on the characters appearing in Marvel comics. And I, and the DC ones, some of them were a little more savvy. The Wonder Woman dude. Bob Kane, who didn't create Batman, always gets credited as the creator of Batman. Two guys that did Superman always get credited. It's just contractual stuff for them. But I, I don't know. I, I'm sure Whedon will have some kind of tiny little check. That you know, that kind of money that really hurts to spend. <laughs> a- anyhow, I'm I'm not a fan of this idea. I just wanted to get that out there because the outcry has been so loud. 
that I fully believe this is going to be one of those projects that doesn't end up happening. Oh. Like a Nicolas Cage as Superman, like J.J. <laughs> Abrams' version of Superman, things like that. Uh, like where anything involving Superman just doesn't happen for some <laughs> reason. <laughs> well, I, Superman is beloved. He is an American institution. He's probably a global institution because I remember one time he went over and he fixed the Leaning Tower of Pisa and he saved somebody on the Eiffel Tower and stuff. So, yeah. You know, yeah, he well, also became a Soviet at one alternate reality. That was pretty good. Right. But that didn't really affect us because it was an alternate reality. Oh. In fact, it's possible that Superman actually only exists in an alternate reality. I think that might be true. Grr, arg. But people have just been really upset about this, really up in arms of, you know, Joss Whedon made Buffy what it is and without him it's not going to work and and I remember you asking me what was it you asked you remember I think it was why is it that you were such a douche no 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 that 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 you asked right before we started recording it was when I mentioned this Buffy thing to you uh maybe I asked if you were going to see it and I believe I responded I will see an Indiana Jones movie with Shia LaBeouf <laughs> in the title <laughs> role before I see this Buffy movie you're a stupid girl. And uh, you're not a fan of Buffy, right? Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I haven't been able to get into it yet. I think I saw... Did I see the whole first season? I think you've given me the disc. I don't. Is the first disc of the second season. So I think I saw the whole first season. You did. But uh, I, ha I, from what I understand, the second season is where it really takes off. And I haven't watched them. I've got stuff to do, I guess. I don't know. But... Yeah, I, I haven't become a big fan of it yet. Don't I believe count your it out. wife is a big fan of abstinence metaphors in vampire fiction. And so <laughs> we don't get uh, as much into the Buffy thing. I'm sick of this crap. The, the, I don't imagine this is going to happen. I really don't. It's Buffy is not Superman, but she is very, or the series is very beloved from a much bigger fan base than Firefly has. Oh, yeah. And I'd say two-thirds of the Buffy fandom realized that all of the things we love about it came from Joss Whedon. Uh -huh. uh, whereas, uh, you know, a show like Cheers or a show like Friends, uh, you know, a show like Laugh Olympics, people don't necessarily realize the people behind the scenes that made that show happen. You know, they just figured it created itself. Right. From the side of Zeus, fully formed. It's, it doesn't have an auteur behind it. No, I, I don't think that's the case. But for some reason, Joss Whedon, uh, probably just because of his very public persona and his fan-friendly way about him, made it known that this was his show and his characters and we're all part of a family and let's laugh together and cry yeah. together. Can you think of any other TV guy that has been has become known as an auteur i guess there's what david kelly that does those law type shows david kelly did the boston legal the practice and Alley so he's Deal. probably got some kind of a auteur type image or something behind those shows i guess I, honestly i think he's best known as the man who regularly plows michelle pfeiffer rather than the creator of of say boston public or I'm just trying to think, is there anybody else other than Joss Whedon that has that from television? You know, there's lots of film guys that are considered to be auteurs, but TV doesn't seem to have that kind of... It's all just kind of considered to be a really collaborative thing, and people don't ever think, oh yeah, this guy is the guy that did that show. What, what about the guy that did Lost, isn't that... That's J.J. Abrams. And yeah, yeah, I think J. J. Abrams, Abrams has, has to got... be fairly well known. Because a lot of times it'll be like J.J. Abrams, oh. undercovers, already canceled, and uh, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> I know somebody who was telling me that when they were making that new Star Trek that he did, that he's like, J.J. Abrams hasn't gone wrong yet, so I'm excited about this because it should be good. Yeah. So, I, And, you know, if you watch a lot of television, often – the creators will have their own little logo at the end and you get to know, you know, as, oh, Dick Wolf Productions or Stephen J. Canal or... Gur Arg. Well, Gur Arg is, is Joss, but, uh, you know, <laughs> Sidhu Boo Sit, good dog. Oof. Uh, right. Uh, Chris Carter, I made this, you know, these things like that. But, uh, except for maybe Rod Serling, there's, there's very few that actually come out and people are like, oh, this is the guy who made this, you know what I mean? Right. If, if you're the host of Alfred Hitchcock Presents or something, you know. But uh, I, I, Gene Roddenberry, when he was around, was probably as well known as any TV creator. 
What about Ron Moore? He's he's well known, and I think part of it is because of his interaction with the fans. When you and I watched Battlestar Galactica, uh, he would do a, a commentary th- that he would podcast for every episode, and you and I, we, I, without fail, I would listen to those, yeah. and you got an insight into. Uh, the writing of the show, scenes that were deleted, ways that they were going to go and ended up changing and stuff. And when he was a Star Trek writer, he would do that a lot in the infancy of the internet. And I always really associated him with like the best episodes of Next Generation or Deep Space Nine. I felt like I knew him more than other writers because of that persona that he had, that approachableness. And you know, I think that's important in today's day and age to create a following of not just your product, but you. Yeah. And, you know, that's something that M. Night Shyamalan did early on and ended up coming around and biting him right on the arse. Right on the Indian arse. <laughs> Dude, you're going to go there again. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Philadelphian arse. Uh, okay, anyhow. No, no Philadelphia. Those guys get mean. Don't upset them. That's the last thing we need. Aren't the Eagles from Philadelphia? Yes. Like Don Henley and Golan? <laughs> yes, all four of them. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Uh, Even the guys that left the band early were also from Philadelphia. I like that. Uh, anyhow, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll return you to your regularly scheduled absolutely nothing. But Joss actually uh, posted something online, or his reaction to this Buffy news. And I just wanted to share that on the air. Just because, I, you know, if there's one person out there that's not aware of who this guy is and in what good hands the Avengers are, maybe this will help. Uh, do you want to read that? You read Joss's, uh, he sent an email to E! online. Okay. I'm not very good at reading things out loud, but I'll give it a shot. That's an understatement. Uh, I mean, you'll give it a hell of a shot is what I'm saying. Joss Whedon is my master now. I'm glad you asked for my thoughts on the announcement of Buffy the Cinema Film. This is a sad, sad reflection on our times, when people must feed off the carcasses of beloved stories from their youths. Just because they can't think of an original idea of their own, like I did with my Avengers idea that I made up myself. Obviously, I have strong, mixed emotions about something like this. My first reaction upon hearing who was writing it was... Whit Stillman and Wes Anderson? This is going to be the most sardonically adorable movie ever. Apparently, I was misinformed. Then I thought... Oh, wait, wait, let me interrupt. Uh, the, the, the writer is a guy called Whit Anderson. You know, somebody we've never heard of before, and that's, that's where that joke is going. Oh, well, all right. And then I thought, I'll make a mint. This is worth more than all my Toy Story residuals combined which I'm assuming he probably gets none. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) There's no creator credit on Toy Story, is there? I don't know. I mean, he was just one of the Yeah, he was one of the writers on on it. Apparently, I am seldom informed of anything, and possibly a little slow. But seriously, are vampires even popular anymore? (laughs) I always hoped that Buffy would live on even after my death. But you know... After. I don't love the idea of my creation in other hands, but I'm also well aware that many more hands than mine went into making that show what it was, and there is no legal grounds for doing anything other than sighing audibly. I can't wish people who are passionate about my little myth ill. I can, however, take this time to announce that I'm making a Batman movie, because there's a franchise that truly needs updating. So look for The Dark Knight Rises way earlier than that other one and also more cheaply and in Toronto, rebooting into a theater near you. Leave me to my pain. Sincerely, Joss Whedon. I don't know. I just figured I ought to share that. You really need to have every square inch of your ass kicked. I don't know how much we've talked about Buffy the Vampire Slayer on here. We've certainly talked about Firefly. And uh, we've both shared our love for Joss Whedon, for Dr. Horrible. I I always felt like uh, there were many, many more Buffy universe stories he wanted to tell and wasn't able to. They were going to make a Faith spinoff series after Buffy ended. 
And Elijah Dushku chose to go a different way, and then they decided. That's right. <laughs> then they decided to make a trio of made-for-TV movies, and it was going to be a, a Faith movie, a Spike movie, and a Giles movie. And none of those ended up happening. Uh, and then they decided they would make a spin-off series set in England called Ripper, that was just about Giles when he went back to England, and that almost happened. They made a uh, rip-off version of Buffy in England. They did. Yes, <laughs> uh, it was called Hex. Oh, absolutely gorgeous girl that played that lead. She was uh, Christina Cole. She was in the good last Bond film. But uh, I always figured if Avengers was a huge hit, that everybody with whom Joss had old relations would come to him and say, why don't you do something for us? Remember all that talk we used to have about you doing TV movies and TV series and an animated Buffy series? Animated Buffy series almost happened as well. They got halfway through the pilot before the plug was pulled on that. And I always assumed that he would get his shot as soon as Avengers came out. But I guess that could still happen, but, yeah. but I don't know. I don't think I've ever mentioned, but online... There's a group of people that are doing a, a podcast, audio version of Buffy Season 8, uh -huh. which is a comic book series that he is sort of executive producing that picks up after the series ended with more adventures with these characters and where so-and-so went and who ends up not being dead. Uh, it is so comic booky, But I've been voicing the character of Rupert Giles in there previously on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And it's such a blast. We got to this second arc that's all about Faith. And you, you never made it far enough into the show to even know who Faith is? I don't know who Faith is. Just imagine a younger, much hotter vampire slayer. Okay, I've got it. There you go. And it, it takes place in England, most of it. And Giles and Faith go off and have this adventure where he trains her in a very My Fair Lady-ish way to try and pass as an English socialite so that she can get close to this rogue slayer who's like a baronet or something like that. She's high up in English society, and she's got the slayer abilities as, as Buffy does, and she's allied herself with this demon and is plotting to assassinate the queen. So Faith has to get in there and get close to her and find out her plan and then kill her. And because she's not got qualms about murder and such, Giles has volunteered her for this task. And it's so much fun to watch these two interact because, now granted, you didn't get that far in the series. They almost interacted none at all on the show because Faith is an anti-rules, anti-proper etiquette kind of person. And Giles was really strict, you know, these are the ways things are done uh -huh. kind of thing. And to see those two hand in hand is really cool. And anyway, when she gets close to the rogue slayer, she finds out that the queen that she's going to assassinate is the queen of the slayers, namely Buffy Ann Summers. And so she has to make the decision of, do I let her take out Buffy, which would be nice? Or do I go ahead and complete my mission? Holy cow, I, I have not had that much fun doing podcast work outside of our own show ever it just it was just really really a blast to do that and uh cool anyhow i'm sorry i've kept you up way too long let's go play pong all right i'm i'm all for that controller so do you have anything more to say i honestly don't i, I can't think of anything we don't uh, since it's a ten thousand word story we don't, we don't have, have to, to talk go long pong. but okay well if, if the story is that long then maybe we should just <laughs> stop. We could probably do that. Not let uh, folks be having to spend their entire week listening to the show. But yeah, thanks a lot, Void, for sending that story out, for being a part of the Broken Mirror Story Contest. And you know what? Thanks to everyone else who was also a part of the Story Contest. You can swing by the website and read their stories as well. You know, they all said it was okay, and we have published the text versions of all their stories. So you guys can all get the same experience that we all got as the readers of, uh, you know, judging these stories. We all got the opportunity to look at all the stories and see what they did with that one topic, which I've said it a hundred times probably by now, but that's my favorite part of the whole thing is being able to see all the different takes that people go with the exact same premise. So, swing over and check that out, and you can leave comments on each person's story, etc. And so, yeah, you know. They could even leave donations. They could, but only donations for us. The people who have a story, they don't get squat. 
Well, we paid void, right? We did. Okay. If you'd like to submit a story to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, put your story in the body of an email, and please be sure to check out the submission guidelines first. All right, so we're open for submissions again. Do you want to give them that uh, address if they want to send us a submission? Uh, sure, submissions at dunesteve.com. Oh, you know, why, why, why you bring that up, you know, I've always been curious, the word Dunesteve, where does that come from? Huh, I've never been curious about that, but... Um, what it comes from, it turns out, is uh, it's it's named after a man. Darren Doonstief was his name, actually. Well, he was a famous guy? Yeah. He's pretty famous. He's the first man to ever die of autoerotic asphyxiation. And you named the podcast after him? Wouldn't you? Uh, so, so send in those submissions, folks, but make sure you read the submission guidelines first. Yes. Okay, so thank you for listening all the way to the end. Yeah. And we will see you bright and early next time for the third and final entry in the Broken Mirror Story event. That's right. I have been Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Good night. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. Okay, I'm going to ha- cast you as the pudgy man. Oh, typecasting. I see how it is. All the votes have been tallied. And it's time to crown this year's Spring King Fair King. That's kind of awkward to say. Let me try that one more time. (laughs) I just wasted my burp. I warned you. Yeah, but it was like on its way out. Yours wasn't even registering sound. So there, you've got just desserts. Okay, try now. Oh, that was the weakest burp ever. We're doing Dax Plays Fairy first, because that's the first episode. Oh, is it? Yeah. It should air before May He Reign Forever, because May He Reign Forever was the overall champion, so that would be the last oh, one. Oh, it was. Yeah, I thought Dax Plays Fairy was the overall champion. No. That's Dax weird. Plays With Fairies <laughs> was the overall champion. <laughs> Today, we bring you, happily, the first of the... Are you sure? I swear we have already recorded a Broken Mirror episode. Sneezes in the Ass King is also a broken mirror story. And that should hopefully be the first one. Oh, okay. So Dax this is, is our number second. two. V O I D. Now, what was weird is it was capital V O I D. The whole, all caps, V O I D. Right. Uh, I think it means it's a Roman numeral. Is there an O? Is it so O a Roman numeral or a D? Five is the V. Right. I, I is the one, one. But I don't know what the zero or the uh, D might be. I, I never. That's all right. They do. There you go. <laughs> it's just funny that a two year old teach him. I teach him subversive things. Yes, but you are a subversive piece of crap. <laughs> That's how we should start the episode. <laughs> When Reg said this town was in the middle of nowhere, he wasn't kidding. Okay, I want you to do the whole story with a little more laid film back. Noir, okay. Drop the G's from your words and stuff and just tell the story. You know, that's what I was trying to do, but you want... I was. Well, just it just of, sounded like the way that we normally read, very stilted. Yeah. Um, when, Sucky. When Reg said this town was in the middle of nowhere, he wasn't kidding. But, you know. When Reg said this town... No, no, that's how you said it. Right. And I wanted you to... I was speak. trying to do it more... When Reg said this town was in the middle of nowhere, he wasn't kidding. I mean, is that okay, or do I got to drop the G? Uh, okay, if that's the way you want to do it, that's fine. When, I, when Reg said this town was in the middle of nowhere, he wasn't kidding. You know, I get this whole planned community thing, but... what <laughs> You butt plug in the shape of a little duck. <laughs> Hey, people say thin. They say that on every rap song I listen to. Here's the thin. We started out friends. <laughs> yeah, but that has the letter U instead of the word U. <laughs> okay. 
I was thinking I almost go and film. No- when Reg said this town was in the middle of nowhere, he wasn't kidding. You know, I get this whole plan community thing, but it's a good thing that I'm not supposed to really do this voice because it sucks. Play fair, Dax. You mean Renaissance fair? <laughs> Flagpoles sporting the American and Nevada state flags sprout up from the roof of each of the three buildings. Can you do that line again but say Nevada? No. And you can die. How can I help you, sir? Is that too hick? This guy's from Nevada, not Arkansas. How can I help you, sir? I did it exactly the same. (laughs) Pretty much. I pull out my badge and ID and flip the leather case open to show it to the local cop. I'm Special Agent De- Deaxator. Use the force. The scary sound. The door going squee. Oh, I forgot we were, I was supposed to scream like the hand. I was going to do an air or something. Closer to three. This is for that guy that doesn't like uh, water pouring in a cup. <laughs> he's, nope. he's probably stopped listening long ago because I think we've done things just to piss him off more than once. <coughs> Ew. Darn, man. I don't like those kind of burps. They can make me feel icky inside. If you have any other questions, someone will be right here. Or you can just call us in your room phone. I'll be right here. Okay. (laughs) But that she also charged a room at this motel to it, and her last charge was on Sunday at Apollo Coffee. Like Starbuck, but no, it's Apollo. Oh, that's clever, isn't it? (laughs) That's a Battlestar Galactica thing. There you go. I walk over to the waist-high railing, enclosing the Ferris wheel. Pull out my beige. Hey! (laughs) It's a family show. Don't talk about pulling out your beige. I would think so. How's the stogie? It's delicious. I haven't lit it yet. This end is all soggy and repugnant. (laughs) It smells like the worst breath imaginable. It smells like I've had it in my ass. (laughs) Well, you ought to stop sticking it there, then. No wonder it's so soggy. Hey, man has needs. At the front is a police officer I haven't seen before. He fires his service pistol, putting another hole in my already hurting chest. (coughs) That was the gun blast. His, his, His gun burped out around. A young woman in a Maneki Neko in the Chanchu t-shirt. Damn, that's hard to say. Couldn't he have picked like just Metallica or Def Leppard or something? I do, I'm not really going to be Agent Adam, so you can be her if you want. Inhabit that role. Be Agent Adams, all right? I don't know if they just don't want to be in such a tight space with us, or if the demon just wants to laugh at us while we try to climb stairs with our ankles chained together. But it is the stairs we are led to. Damn that demon. Damn him to hell. Wahoviak. Okay, I'm going to ha- cast you as the pudgy man. Oh, typecasting. I see how it is. All the votes have been tallied, and it's time to crown this year's Spring King Fair King. That's kind of awkward to say. Let me try that one more time. Long live the king! Long live the king! Chants the crowd. I have just about had enough of this. I have just about had enough of this. Ah, uh, too? None of the demon's puppets are paying any attention to us now. They are all too busy cheering for the dead body on the stage. Now what? Adams asks. Adams asks. Let me do that more time without laughing, too. For what? To kiss me? Come on, give me some sugar, baby. You're the good ash. I'm the bad ash. Good, bad. I'm the one with the gun throwing the demon's puppets aside like they're rag dolls as I fight my way towards the woman I was originally sent to rescue. We're almost done. Yeah, very, very much. So, I don't know what that means, but I said it. And I ain't taking it back. As we head toward the flashing lights and the blaring music in the distance, 
the the and, and, said the townspeople in a strange monotone. The cake is a lie. No! Uh, may the force be with us. I want to see Jake's Gyllenhaal. Where is that? There's actually a site where you can, if you really want to see his Gyllenhaal. <laughs> Just shows you a picture of Maggie. And you're like, ah, ah! that's worse than I thought it would be. <laughs> that's so cool. Because she's beautiful. Oh, she is beautiful. Oh, you want to know how I got one. these scars on my arse. That makes the story the better the second time around, exactly like Tobias Bakel was saying. Do you love Tobias Bakel? You know, I've not really read much of his stuff, to tell you the truth. Only thing I, I may have ever read of his was that anachoinosis story that never got used. <laughs> that was, out, that was him, That huh? still, still has unused. not been used. And that's a great story, too. I really liked that story. It, it was, was 2008 when we recorded that. Well... No, I think it was January 2009. Yeah, I think it was just after in 2009, and it's almost been two full years. That's something that I would not be able to handle on my conscience. I would have gotten it out much sooner than now. But I've always got the idea of we're basically kind of going in the order of when we got the stories kind of a thing. You know? Yeah, we try to, unless it's a Valentine's Day or a Christmas right. or something like that. I, I've found that a reader can make or break a story, too. That's true. And yeah, I'm not going to name names or anything <laughs> like that. I mean, all of this is going to be in the outtakes. Yeah, anyway. I know. That's so this is gone. So all Wendy, of this. enjoy this conversation. The outtakes. But you know, there there are a couple of readers that, that their voices just don't engage me. Deep. They don't carry me along. There are some that make me sleepy or distracted. Where <laughs> I I don't mean to to criticize. It's just I prefer the kind of reader who says, "Gather round the fire." It's like, okay, everybody's crunching. Here we go. And they tell it as though they're telling a tale mm -hmm. rather than as though they're reading from a text or as though they are giving some kind of a lecture in a hall. Mm -hmm. Just the, the intimacy of a storyteller, of the storyteller, is what engages me. And there's some people that do that very, very well. And there are other people that their focus is elsewhere. And Well, it's a definitely a skill to be learned, too. We live in this region where they have this annual storytelling festival. Oh, right. And I've always been tempted to go. I've never gone. Me neither. Uh, I was but tempted I, to go as well, though. I, I, I'm curious as what a storytelling festival would be. Did somebody get around and, and, and say, okay... <laughs> The wind in the willows. And then he tells the story or he's got the text in front of him. I mean, is, is it a competition? You know, or it's just I, I've seen everybody it on the gets news. an hour. I've uh. seen some of it on the news. I don't know if any of that is involved, but just some people on the news live there have talked to a guy and the guy would be like, oh, you know, and he'd tell a funny story about his dog or something like that. And uh, I think one of the things is that you can't be reading from a text. You have to like know the story oh. in your head. That's one of the uh, deals. It's like you're telling the story around the campfire. It's not like you're reading the story to people around the campfire. I think that's one of the things would, with the festival, at least. I would go to that. Would yeah, it would be interesting. It would be fun to do that. we got to check it out my, next year. That's a long time This is going to be my from audition now. for the, uh, the storytelling festival. And once again, this is just for Wendy <laughs> because we love you, Wendy. I have room in my heart for two listeners, but right now there's, there's only you. A, a boy is watching TV and his dad comes in the room and asks him to turn it off. And he says, son, sit down on the couch with me. It's time for us to talk about the birds and the bees. And the boy says, no, no, dad, please. And he's like, no, no, it's, it's time. And, you know, I'll make it as painless as possible. And the boy starts, his, he starts to tear up. And the dad says, wait, wait, I haven't even started talking yet. What is so terrible? What's wrong? What are you afraid of? And he says, when I was seven, you told me there was no tooth fairy. And when I was eight, you told me there wasn't a meat Easter bunny. And when I was nine, you told me there was no Santa Claus. He's like, now that I'm ten, are you going to tell me that men and women don't get laid? <laughs> if so, there's nothing I'll have to look forward to. Anyway, that's why I'm not part of the storytelling festival, <laughs> because I didn't... Uh, sell that story the way that I should have. And then that's also part of why it wasn't part of our real episode. All right. <sighs>